Welcome to Liberty Grace Church. Whether you come as a skeptic, curious about Jesus, or a follower of him, we're honored to have you with us. If this is your first time with us, we invite you to connect with us by filling out a connection card found online at libertygrace.ca forward slash register. You can see the link on the screen. We also invite you to download our app. You can use the app to find out about events, read the Bible and more. Check it out and download it when you've got a chance. If you're attending on Zoom, we invite you to engage with us by turning on your video and using the chat box feature. As a tangible expression of loving one another, we have a few instructions for those of us who are here in person. First, worship in your hearts as you listen to the singing of our worship leader today. You may hum and speak, but please do not sing out loud. Second, keep, your, keep a two meter separation at, from all who are not in your bubble. And finally, if you're ill while you are here, please go home immediately and contact your healthcare provider or a COVID-19 assessment center for guidance about testing. There are many sayings about the value of time. For example, time is more valuable than money. One person has said, time is priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never get it back. So often in our lives, we want to control our time and our circumstances. We want time to pass quickly so we can get to that next season. We want time to pass slowly if we're enjoying ourselves. We want to escape the hard times. Ecclesiastes tells us in our passage today that there is a time for every season and that God is in control over it all. Let's pray as we start our service today. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are outside of time. You were there before this world existed, and a thousand years to you are like a day. Help us to appreciate each moment of every season that we are in. Help us to appreciate the very breath that we breathe in this moment, in this time. We ask also that you would be with us in our service today as we learn more about you and from your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I invite you guys to join me in your hearts, your minds, and your homes as we worship God together. Oceans in his hands, who has numbered every grain of sand. Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God. See
felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to Our scripture reading for today can be found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 
verses 1 to 13, and also on chapter 4, verses 6 to 12. Oh. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sue, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Chapter 4, verses 6 to 12. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after wind. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person was no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is God's holy word. I have a very basic argument to make today. Uh, the argument is based on two propositions. I'll see if you track and agree with this. Proposition number one, life is hard. So can I get a mover, seconder? Everyone agree with that? Life is hard. It comes at you with relentless force. Uh, it, is, it is just, you know, those uh, punching, those inflatable punching clowns that you'd knock over and it comes back up and then you, if life feels like that, just like pound, pound, pound. And we keep trying to uh, come back up again, but it keeps on coming at us. So life is hard. Proposition number two is, We've got to find ways to cope. We've got to find ways to cope. And we try different things to get through life. We try relationships. We try a, a fun. We try uh, ambition. We try all kinds of things. Last week, we looked at some of them. Uh, and do you agree with that? It's like, how do you get through? Well, we look for meaning, or we look for pleasure, or we look for relationships. We look for something to get us through. That is really the main issue that we face in life. How do we deal with how hard life is in a way that we can keep going? How can we deal with the relentless pressure, the exhaustion, the uh, stress? How do we do it in a way that we can keep going, that we can sustain ourselves and not give up? That's a problem we all need to answer. It is really, uh, even if it's something you don't think about, it is something that is basically your life. On Friday, if you work a nine to five job on Friday night, you're like, woohoo, I have the next few days to be free, hopefully, of pressure. 
and to find, to switch into the stuff that gives me life. Tomorrow morning, if you're a Monday nine to five or tomorrow morning, it's like, okay, life is gonna be hard again, but I'm gonna get through it because I'm gonna get to the point that I love. Or some of you, it's the very opposite. It's like weekends, bleh, I live for work and uh, I work so that I can find meaning in my life. Well, that's what we've been looking at in Ecclesiastes. We're in the third week and I wanna give you a, a quick review of where we've come so far. So week one was this, life is a vapor. That's one of the hard parts about life. It is a vapor. It is something that you can't really get your hands on. It, it's very hard to pin down and it's gone like this. Last week, we looked at the fact that, well, we need to find ways to make life work. And so we, look at, so we looked at some things that we normally try to basically find meaning in life. We looked at learning and pleasure and achievement, and we found that these don't work. And so this is where we are so far, that this is, these are some of the typical approaches we have to finding meaning in life. And today I wanna ask really how we get through life and how we cope with how hard life is. And today I wanna look at uh, the two chapters that we just read parts of Ecclesiastes 3 and 4 because it describes two approaches to life that are really ways of coping with how hard life is. So here they are. I want, us, I want you to consider which one or both represents you, and then we're going to look at a better way than these two ways. So here's approach number one for dealing with how hard life is, trying to control life. Our approach to life because it's hard, is to try to mold it to our liking. We try to control life. Example of this is Julia Hurricane Hawkins, who took up running at the age of 100. She quickly racked up three world records by age 102. At 103 years old, Last year, she won gold in both the 50 and 100 meter races. And she said when she was interviewed at 103 years old, I hope that I'm inspiring others to be healthy and realize that you can still be doing it at this kind of age. She said, every day when you are 103 is a miracle. Well, she is an example of somebody who's trying to overcome the natural limitations of life. And I admire that, Julia Hurricane Hawkins, and we can all hope what to live to be 103. If you're doing races at 103, good for you. She would buy into the philosophy that the only limits in life are those that we impose upon ourselves. If you hang around very long, there's a lot of people in Toronto who believe this. Overcome the obstacles, basically impose your will on life. Nobody can define what the obstacles are. You need to, you need to overcome all the obstacles and if you believe in yourself and push yourself hard enough, you can live the life that you want to live. No, don't let anybody tell you that you can't live that life. Seize control. Seize control. Well, Ecclesiastes 3 comes along. And Ecclesiastes 3 basically says this approach cannot work in the long term. Ecclesiastes 3, that Sully just read for us, says there are limits. And one of the major limits is that there are seasons in life. There's a season for everything, everything. In the first few verses, probably the most popular verses in Ecclesiastes, the writer, the preacher lists 14 areas of life in verses one to eight. And he says all of them, basically, there's going to be a season in your life for uh, your life is going to include all of these things. And basically, you don't get to control what season you're in. And so if you look at that, basically, he's reminding us God is in charge of your life and you are not in charge of your life. I mean, to give you a very example, uh, uh, the first example he gives is there's a time to be born. You and I did not choose when we would bo be born. We were not consulted on our birth. 
I mean, our parents went ahead. Maybe even some of them didn't plan that you would be born. But against your, you know, nobody consulted you, you were born. And he goes on to say, you know, there's going to be a time when you're going to die. Nobody's going to consult you on that day. Uh, death will come to you if you're ready for it or not. You have no control over that unless you take your life, which isn't a very good idea. And he goes on and lists all these different areas that all of our lives are going to be full of, you know, there's a time to break down and there's a time to build up. If you've lived long enough, you've been through periods of deconstruction in your life where things are falling apart and you can't help it. Things are just falling apart. And then you turn a corner and one day there's a season where things begin to look up and you've been longing for that day, but you can't control it. That's what the preacher is saying. God is in charge of the seasons of your life and we're not. There's a time for everything, but we're not in control of much of it. And if you didn't already believe that, after 20 and 20, all of us should believe that. We are not in control of our lives. The in-between is totally outside of our control. As somebody said, the created world has a rhythmic pattern built into it, and our lives within this world experience their own regularities and cadences that ebb and flow with the rolling years. I know a couple, they plan everything, and I mean everything. When they go on holiday, they, the first thing they do is months before is they open up a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and they plan their holiday to 15 minute increments. And so when they go on holiday, they're always consulting their spreadsheet to say, you know, what do we need to do now? We're, we're six minutes behind, we need to get to the next thing. They map out every restaurant that they're going to go to and everything is planned down to the minute. And it's not just their vacation, they plan their whole lives like that. And what Ecclesiastes is saying is this approach cannot work. You can plan all you want, but you can't ultimately plan how your life is going to turn out. There's seasons that are beyond your control. If you'll notice, all of these things add up to, basically, they cancel themselves out. You know, there's a time to be born and a time to die. The net result of that is zero. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. The net result of that is zero. They cancel each other out. And that's why in verse 9, the teacher says, what gain does a worker have for all, all his toil? Do you ever wonder that? When you look at your life, the fact that you're not in charge of the seasons, that everything cancels itself out. You work to get in shape and ultimately your body breaks down. You work all your life to earn money, but then all the bills need to be paid. Ultimately, everything cancels itself out. You're born, but eventually you die. It all cancels itself out. And that's why in verse nine, the, the teacher says, the preacher says, it, what does that add up to? Verse 19, the harshest reality is this, that ultimately we die. He says, for what happens to the children of men and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts. All is vanity. We control less than we think. And ultimately it all adds up to nothing. Now, if you've, if you've been here the past couple of weeks, you know that Ecclesiastes can be depressing. But I think what he's saying here is he's really bursting our bubble of thinking we can control life and make it what we want to. He's saying the same thing. He's not trying to, it, this week he's actually got a, some good news for us. But I think he's pointing us to, if you're trying to control life, give up now because it's not going to work. He's giving us the bad news before he gives us the good news. He's really saying the same thing that James said, that you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes. And then James says, we ought to always approach all of life saying that if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Basically, we're not in control. God is in control. He gets to decide. Canadian pastor Mark Buchanan says this, I woke up one morning barren of fruit, bereft of joy, short of daylight. I could not shake it off. I could not make a thing 
grow. He says, I saw a counselor. I had people pray for me. I read books. I begged God. I faked it. Nothing ended it. And then one day, God gave me insight. This was winter. It would end in time, but not of my own doing. My responsibility was simply to know the season and match my actions and inactions to it. It was to learn the slow, hard discipline of waiting. I want to ask you today, uh, especially if you're a control freak, if you're trying to get through life's difficulty by trying to control life, do you see that it doesn't work? What season are you in right now? Your responsibility isn't to change the season. We can't do that. Our responsibility is to recognize the season that we're in and match our actions to it. To cry out to the Lord, knowing that he's sovereign over every part of our life. To release the burden of thinking we, we can even control our lives. Stop coping with the difficulty of life by trying to pretend that you're in control of your life. It just doesn't work. Okay, that's approach one. Life is hard, and so a lot of us try to control life. And Ecclesiastes is saying, hey, there's seasons to life. Uh, you're not in control of the seasons. They all cancel each other out anyway. Stop trying to pretend you're God. But here's the second approach that we often try. It's getting ahead. And this is what chapter four talks about. We try to beat the obstacles and get ahead of others. We try to cope with life being hard by getting ahead. And by the way, you can do both approaches. If you really wanna cope with how hard life is, I mean, some people try to control and get ahead at the same time. If you really want a headache, do both. But in chapter four, he says, this is how a lot of people try to cope with the difficulty of life. They try to get ahead. Chapter four is about me my plans, my career, my desire to get ahead. And so in verses one and two of chapter four, he talks about people, powerful people getting ahead while others are oppressed. Does that sound familiar? Those who have a lot oppressing those who don't have very much, using their position to get ahead. That's verses one and two. It's like today's newspaper. In verse four, he talks about work motivated by the desire to get ahead of other people. It's like if I work hard enough, if I advance and get that position, then I'll know I've beaten everybody else. And then I'll know that I'll matter. If I get this degree, if, if I am recognized for this accomplishment, then I'll know my life matters. In verses seven to eight, he talks about people who never stop working because they're never satisfied with the light with what they have, even though it doesn't make them happy. Again, that sounds very relevant to today. I have friends who come into Toronto and they go downtown and they watch people go to work back when people used to go to work downtown. And they would say, people just don't look happy. What is it for? Well, I'm working so that I can have meaning in my life, but it doesn't give us the meaning that we're looking for. Please don't misunderstand what Ecclesiastes 4 is saying. It is not saying that work is bad. You were created for work. God, it was part of the original reason that God put us here on this earth to work. God has given us all. I mean, if, if you want a death sentence, retire at the age of 30 and spend the next, you know, 40, 50 years doing nothing, it will drive you crazy. We were made to make a contribution to this world. But what Ecclesiastes 4 says, when we turn that in and we are motivated just by the desire to get ahead, to find meaning in life by trying to get ahead, it doesn't work. It leads to dissatisfaction. It doesn't give us the meaning we're looking for. As somebody said, busyness can be an addictive drug. Busyness acts to repress our inner fears and personal anxieties as we scramble to achieve an enviable image to display to others. We become outward people obsessed with how we appear rather than inward people reflecting on the meaning of our lives. Again, let me ask you, 
How many of us are trying to cope with how hard life is by getting ahead? How many of us are trying to push ahead of the crowd and make a name for ourselves and achieve success, thinking that that will give us the mastery over life that we're looking for? These are two very different but common ways to try to deal with life being hard. We try to control it. We try to work to get ahead of others. If you're really fancy, you can do both. But we're not in control. And Ecclesiastes says, working to get ahead won't ultimately satisfy us. There's got to be a better way. Okay. Ecclesiastes can be very realistic and very depressing. It isn't afraid to tell us the cold hard truth. And as usual today, the passage is, said, hey, guys, I've tried this. Just so you know, it doesn't work. But I want to point out that this week, there's actually really good news. Because instead of trying to control, instead of just trying to get ahead, Ecclesiastes points to better solution that all of us can apply right now. And so let's wrap this up by looking at actually what Ecclesiastes says we can do instead of these things. Life is hard. What do we do to cope with how hard life is? Well, the first thing is this in chapter three, instead of trying to control life, enjoy it. Instead of trying to control life, enjoy it. Instead of trying to mold life to your will, receive it as a gift, enjoy it. Where do I get this from? I love Ecclesiastes three, verse 12. In the middle of this passage, basically saying, you can't control the seasons of your life. In the middle of all of that, he says, I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. And also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. This is God's gift to man. Let me try to paraphrase what he's saying. Oh, by the way, chapter four, verse six, a very similar thought. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands of toil and striving after wind. So here's what I think the preacher is saying. Look, if you want a child and you've desperately wanted a child, I think what the author is saying is, look, you have no control over when a child is given to you. But here's what you do have control over. Enjoy the stage that you're in. And pray, yes, you can pray all you want that God will change it. But don't miss the blessings that you get to enjoy right now. If you're working right now, don't miss the blessings of that job that drives you crazy. You have no control how long the season will last, but don't miss the good things that God is doing in your life right now that you get to enjoy. Basically, the, the teacher is saying life is full of good things and bad things. You really don't get to choose those things. You can choose, though, to enjoy all the good things that God is giving you right now. Choose. I heard this over Thanksgiving weekend. Somebody said, here's the secret to life. At least it's one of the main secrets of life. Choose what you've been given. In other words, whatever you have right now, if instead of complaining it, you actually choose it and say, I'm going to be grateful and receive it as a gift. Choose what you've been given. Instead of longing for a life that you don't have, enjoy the one that you do have with all of its challenges. Embrace life for what it is, not what you want it to be. I love the permission it gives us, by the way. Actually enjoy life. He says, nothing better for them to do than to be joyful. The Bible is not commanding you to be serious. It says, receive the gifts you have right now and enjoy them. Do good as long as you live. Take opportunity, the opportunities God gives you. Everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. Friends, eat good food. If you have access to it, enjoy every bite. Take pleasure in your work. He says, actually, find meeting and contentment. You can't control life, so receive the blessings God has given you. 
And secondly, instead of trying to get ahead of others, in chapter four, he says, love and serve others. Instead of trying to beat others, join them. Instead of trying to get ahead of them, love and serve them. In verses 10 to 12 of chapter four, the famous verses, if you know anything of Ecclesiastes, uh, you probably heard this maybe at a wedding at some time. Two are better for one than one in four and nine, for they shall have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and doesn't have somebody else to live, lift him up. If two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though one, a man may prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. In a chapter where the author is basically saying a lot of people are just trying to step on other people and get ahead of other people. In chapter four, the preacher says, instead of this, why not actually love other people? Instead of seeing them as obstacles or people to beat, why not enter into a relationship with them? The preacher is saying the value of life is not what you earn, but who you're in relationship with, who you love, who loves you. Your value, and we all know this, right? Your value ultimately isn't going to come from what you achieve with your life, as important as that is. It's not going to come with how much money you earn in the end. At the end of life, you're going to look back and the thing that matters most is, who did I love? Who did I serve? Who did I give my life to? Who loved me? That's going to matter more than anything else. And so the preacher says, look, don't try to control life. Instead, enjoy whatever season you're in. Find joy in whatever God has given you. Don't try to get ahead. Instead, focus on the relationships that God has given you. They're a gift. Enter into them. Love people and enjoy it. Instead of selfishness, isolation, and greed, lean into community, especially because life is hard. We need to know and be known. We were designed to live in community. There's such a relief in learning that we're not God. And then just simply taking the hands off, trying to control, ultra control our lives, just releasing that burden. And with open arms, instead of trying to steer our lives like crazy, just receiving what God is giving you, including the gift of being loved by him through Jesus. And the gift of being part of a church family, he's given us a church family so that we could love each other. Even though your life will still be hard, right now, even in the middle of COVID, in the middle of what other obstacles we're going through, he is giving us good gifts that we can receive. And all of this is an eternal, uh, a taste of the eternal provision that he will give you of his eternal life and love. And so friends, how do we cope with how hard life is? Don't try to cope by taking control or getting ahead of others. Instead, cope with how hard life is by enjoying what God has given you and serving and loving others. And so, Father, whatever season we're in right now, help us to learn that you are in control. Pray that you would help us to find contentment in the life that you've given us instead of the life that we want. I pray that you would help us to move away from isolation and getting ahead. Instead, help us to love and move into community with each other. May we receive all of this knowing that you are our good father who delights in giving us what we need. May we find in Jesus all that we need in this world so that we may enjoy you and your gifts. And most of all, that we would know you the ultimate source of satisfaction. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Daryl. We make some time each week um, for questions and responses. Um, and so some of you may have um, a question, you can raise your hand if you want or submit a question in the chat if you're online. 
um, or even just raise your hand if you've got your video feed on um, and we're happy to take them. Daryl, I'm wondering, um, like this is not the message that the world gives us at all, right? And so we're bombarded with all the other contrary messages that feed um, that like, go, you can do it, positivity, like whatever, it, however you wanna like be successful, don't limit yourself, all those things. How do we, um, you know, bring ourselves back to this focus when we're so inundated with a message that's so completely contrary to that? Great question. Uh, so two quick ideas. One is to very carefully curate what we take in. So if you're regularly reading books and attending things that are telling you, you know, you're in control, take more control, you can do it, overcome. I would suggest that we actually get rid of those as much as possible and uh, be aware that those are giving us a message that runs contrary to scripture. And then the other thing would be, I think we need sources that lean into this, that remind us of these truths. So, you know, if, if you haven't been reading Ecclesiastes, I encourage you at home, read it because it's really good stuff. Just uh, so Trevin Wax has just written a book, uh, Rethink Yourself, that is basically, this is the theme of his book. We've got to rethink the world's messages and it's all about me and it's all about and substitute it with a, a biblical message. So I think get rid of the sources that are telling us the lies as much as possible. Uh, by the way, the worst are Disney movies. Um, I, it's actually interesting how much Disney movies lately, if you think about them, are all about basically you get to define yourself. And so I just be careful. Like, it's not all where you would expect to find this, right? Yeah. Who would ever think that Disney movies are telling us an anti-biblical message a lot of times? I'm going to get in trouble now. People are going to say, why are you picking on Disney? But it's, it's recognizing where it's coming from and then making sure that we're taking in the biblical message. So just a quick follow up on that, because sometimes some of these messages have other messages that can be maybe more aligned biblically, or they can be helpful, they can point out things that were like, oh, I hadn't thought of something that way before. And so maybe can you just like, just tease that out a little bit more? Like, I mean, obviously, we need some discernment there, right? Like, so... Any suggestions on that? Yeah, I think uh, the, you gave the word discernment. So uh, I read widely. I, I've just said to curate, I'm, I've learned to do this, but it doesn't mean I don't read widely. But I think knowing to pick, okay, this is leading me in a bad direction. But then there is a good point on page 34. I'm going to learn from that. Okay, the rest of the book maybe is built on faulty assumptions. But yeah, just knowing having that discernment. I read whole books sometimes, and I think this whole book is basically built on a paradigm that isn't scriptural. And then I find, oh, there's no value. A lot of books, it's like, okay, pick and choose. But I think just being discerning and, and careful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, questions or thoughts? Yep, Jeff. So Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11, the question is, what does it mean that God has put eternity uh, into our heart, a man's heart, that we, uh, yet we cannot find what, out what God has done from the beginning? Great question. What I think he's saying there is all of us uh, are born with, so if you have an animal, uh, we had a dog, a beautiful dog, and the dog, even at the end of his life, it, it just seemed like the dog is in the moment, right? experiencing whatever the it's like the present moment is all that exists well humans aren't like that humans ask big questions about what is the meaning of life where do i go when i die uh i have this impulse that there must be more than uh th than this there has to be a god uh and even atheists i find many times uh are actively fighting this instinct and i think what he's saying there is we are not just animals. God has, has created us to ask the big questions about life, uh, which leads to dissatisfaction with life because we're asking, we're not just living for the moment, we're asking the big questions of life. So I think that's exactly what he's getting at in that passage. So thank you for asking that. Good question. 
Any other questions or thoughts? No? Okay. Great. Thank you, Dar. We've heard God's word open and explain to us, and now it's time for us as a community of believers to respond in worship by giving financially, affirming God's truth, confessing our sins, and receiving assurance of forgiveness. We won't be actually passing an offering plate, but we do ask for your continued support during this time. There are three ways that you can give. You can text Liberty Grace on your smartphone, to 77977, which will connect you with our push pay giving app. You can send an interact e-transfer to info at libertygrace.ca, or you can send a check by mail to the church's mailing address. The donations we receive support the work of this church and other ministries across our province and around our world. We encourage giving because we have all been given um, all that we have is given to us by God, and he calls us to give generously, joyfully, and sacrificially. So I want to take a moment now to give thanks for the things that we've already received from the Lord and to ask him to use what we give to bless our world and bring his kingdom. Heavenly Father, we have prayed often for you to increase our joy. And Lord, we see evidences of you doing that as we share our stories with one another. And so we thank you that you are increasing our joy in you and that you are increasing our joy in the good gifts that you have given to us and blessed us with. Thank you. We pray that you would continue to do this work of transformation in our hearts and lives and that we would discover even yet more joy in who you are and what you are able to do and what you are doing, that we would be uh, given greater boldness to give more of ourselves, more of our talents, more of our time, and more of the financial blessings that you have already given to us, that your kingdom would come with even greater power in Liberty Village and to our world. In your name, amen.
spend some time together in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for Daryl, Lord, and for the message that he has brought to us uh, this evening out of Ecclesiastes. God, we thank you um, for for the reminders that he's given us, God, that um, life is hard, but God, in in the midst of um, this hard life, you have given us such great gifts. God, as he mentioned, even the, the gift of community, we thank you for the community of Liberty Grace, uh, that at a, a time in the world where community is such a challenging thing and, and isolation seems so prominent in our world, God, that you have still gift, gifted us with this church community. God, the ability to, to meet in person, to have a space together to meet um, within Toronto, and God, for the technology that you've allowed um, that lets us meet together online as well. God, that during this time, we are still able to have such a a wonderful community to fellowship together, God, to worship you together, to encourage one another, um, and to remind each other of you. And God, we we thank you for the reminder that we cannot control this life, but Lord, we, we do not need to. You are in control of this life. And God, I pray that you would help us to remember that. Help us to remember in in the hardest of times that you are still in control. Help us to trust in your faithfulness, in your sovereignty. And God, help us um, in in the good times in life when we are... um, when we are successful and things are going well, God, to again, not forget that you are in control, Lord, that um, our, our success is another gift that comes from you. Help us not to be given to pride, but Lord, give you the honor that you are due for our lives. And Lord, we thank you just for the gift that life is. God, the, the great gift that you have given us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom, wisdom in how to use that gift well. Lord, wisdom in how to live for you in each and every day, in each and every moment. God, how to show your love to those who are around us. God, to to be a light in our world, to encourage others around us. God, to be those who who are on fire for you. God, who who, uh, um, keep your word in our hearts. God, help us to be those who um, anxiously go out and share the gospel with those that we meet. And Lord, I pray that, that through each and every one of us and through Liberty Grace Church, God, that you would be at work in Liberty Village and beyond that, God, in, in Toronto, in Ontario, in Canada, and all across the world, Lord, we pray that you would be at work in this world. God, we, we see in 2020 especially how broken this world is, but God, we do trust you because we know that you are good and you are in control. So Lord, each and every day, remind us, remind us of your goodness, remind us of who you are and help us to trust you with every day and with everything that we are. And we pray this in your name, amen. We take a bit of time each week to affirm our faith using questions from the New City Catechism. And today our question is, what hope does everlasting life hold for us? So I invite you to read the response with me. It reminds us that this present fallen world is not all there is. Soon we will live with and enjoy God forever in the new city. 
in the new heaven and the new earth where we will where we will be fully and forever free from all sin and will inhabit renewed resurrection bodies in a renewed restored creation Christ's death and resurrection enables us to come before Christ each week to confess our sins and seek his forgiveness. Please join with me in the prayer of confession found on the screen. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to give you a moment now for a silent confession. First John chapter one has these words of assurance. This is the message we have heard from God and proclaim to you that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. Lord, we thank you that in your faithfulness and mercy, you have promised to cleanse us and change us from the inside out. Help us to continue to live as forgiven and changed people. Amen. I'd like to welcome you. If you are new here, we'd especially like to welcome you and uh, please uh, fill in the uh, registration on uh, the website. We'd just love to have your contact information and be able to keep in touch. Uh, the only uh, announcements I'm going to give this week, there is no uh, grace group, but uh, there is the uh, monthly prayer time, and it's going to be Tuesday on Zoom starting at 630. So please make that a priority. Uh, join us by Zoom. If you're not comfortable praying out loud, nobody will put you on the spot. You don't need to be pressured to show up and uh, we really believe that the, uh, as a church, we, uh, we rely on God's strength. Uh, it is not going to be because we have it all together or we have the power. It's going to be because God has the power. So this is our monthly declaration to God that we are dependent upon him. So I encourage you to come out Tuesday at 630 uh, for a time of prayer. And otherwise, if you're looking at ways to plug in and get involved, uh, let us know there's other stuff going on and we'd love to tell you about that. Uh, we invite you to stick around. Um, uh, oh, but membership, thank you. Uh, we are uh, organizing a membership class. Uh, we've been slow in getting the date, but if you're interested in that, let us know if this is your home church. We would like to invite you to consider becoming a member here and you can ask me about the details of when that will be. Here's a benediction. I'm going to invite you to uh, stick around if you're online and uh, have a little chat with each other if you're able to stick around for a few minutes. And uh, here in person, we're going to celebrate communion together. Here's a benediction before we sing the doxology. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Join with me.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.